We're here now with Vincent Stanley, who is a long time uh, leader at Patagonia. And I know that many of you students, you, you know about Patagonia and I have heard that you admire the company. So I think it's a special uh, uh, pleasure and, and, and privilege to be here with you, uh, Vincent. Thank you for coming on. And what I wanted to know from you is specifically with regard to the, the developments of the, the challenges that business CEOs are facing and that they're increasingly exposed to. What do you see happening? And in 2019, we had the business roundtable statement come out. Uh, we have increasing pressure from investors such as Larry Fink and other pension mm -hmm. funds to look at climate change and the risks of it much more forcefully and push companies at all levels to do more than they have been doing so far. What do you sense in, in, in your circles and also uh, beyond is, is happening and, and how do CEOs see and meet these various challenges? Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I, I, I think it's a little, there's a distinction between the way uh, CEOs or the way companies might look at the challenges now and what I think might be called on in the future. Um, you know, in, in 2015, Pope Francis issued the uh, encyclical Laudato Si, in which he talked about the social and the environmental crisis as essentially one crisis with two faces. Um, and this crisis is becoming more apparent, certainly since 2015, the actual effects of climate change have become a lot clearer. There is a lot more talk about social inequality. We're seeing a lot more dysfunction in governments and the inability of governments to respond in the election of uh, nationalist populist governments around the world. We're even struggling the same way that more liberal governments struggled before. What I see is the need from business over the next 40 years or so, and this is from the perspective of somebody who's been working for 40 years. What I see is that as these crises develop, it's going to become more incumbent on business to work with NGOs and to work with governments to actually create products and services that solve problems rather than create them. And that in the process of making products and offering services, companies are also going to have to examine how they do that. In other words, they're going to have to do good things in a good way. And it's a challenge now because we've spent 40 to 50 years developing a global supply chain for almost everything that's made. And that puts some distance between the managers of companies, between the CEOs and their managers, and the, the production of whatever it is that they're selling. Um, there are curtains at every stage of the supply chain that make it difficult to see what's actually happening. And I think that this is, this is going to be the challenge of the next 40 years to both, how do we change the way we do business in order to resolve the problems? And two, when we're doing business, how do we do it in such a way that will not create problems? I can give you an example. Um, I was just talking to somebody in the, at a major university who works in the hospitality department. And uh, the hospitality department is in charge of feeding uh, more than 10,000 meals a day, delivered by 18 wheelers uh, that uh, come in and out of the, the building. And uh, yet the, the hospitality department has been charged by the university itself to recognize the, the recent Lancet article in 2019 saying that public health really has to follow agriculture. In other words, that we have to create sustainable land use in order to promote human health. And the industrial way in which we feed people actually flies in the face of that. So how is business going to deal with that? Because it's not a government problem. That's a business problem of how to uh, change practices so that both the, the ecological system and human communities will be served. 
Well, so that's, uh, yeah, that's the, removing the curtains. That's, that's one challenge. And that specific yeah. challenge, I think, highlights how this is going through basically every industry and, and any kind of entity, whether it's a university, yeah. it's a government, it's a business of some sort, um, it's organizing. Um, if I can just go back to the business roundtable statement, yeah. And I know that uh, Patagonia is a B Corp and the leaders of the B Corp mm -hmm. movements have issued a challenge as a response. Yeah. Um, what, what is your take on, on such a statement and, and where do you see the challenges for current CEOs, uh, whether they are part of the B Corp movement and the part of the, yeah. the traditional movement? Yeah. Um, I, I think that we all looked at the business roundtable statement, those of us involved in the B Corp movement, and we said, okay, this is great. This is a reality that's being recognized by um, uh, voices in conventional business, um, that we're seeing the beginning of the end of shareholder primacy, which I think has not only done great harm to the, uh, to the environment and to human communities but it's also done harm to business itself because it's because of its emphasis on short-term gain that actually can harm a business long term so we look at that statement and we welcome it but at the same time um, those of us involved in the b corp movement have some understanding of what it actually means to try to improve our practices and to bring them in line with social and environmental needs and it's a it's it's a lot. It's it's a uh, it's a big pull, and and so one of the advantages I think of the of the of the B Corp movement is precisely the B impact assessment that all of us have to submit to every two to three years that looks holistically at our practices and how we affect all of our stakeholders from customers to employees to the communities we operate in and how we're governed and how we operate as businesses with integrity. And I think that that impact assessment provides a kind of discipline for business that is going to be necessary for the business roundtable folks as they start to go down the path that we started down a few years ago. Um, it's not just rhetoric. It's not just communications. It's, a, it's, a, it's strategy. It's discipline. It's learning how to accept constraints and to use those constraints to innovate and to uh, promote our businesses for the future. Wonderful. Are you able to share a little bit of the challenge that, uh, that historically originated at Patagonia? And, and just because you were witness to it from, from early on and, and, and share maybe some of the, the, the major insights that, that uh, you have gained yeah. in that journey. And, you, and I want to recommend to students all the, the book that you have written and co-authored with, with Ivan, your, mm -hmm. your, your, your uncle, that uh, in some way does good, a good job of, of, of sharing uh, the insights there. Yeah. And I would recommend it to everybody as a student just to read about that. And I think we have this privilege here to hear directly from you also, maybe some of the. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell the, um, I'll try to tell it briefly, but I think the classic story is our switch to organic cotton. Um, and we found out accidentally how uh, environmentally harmful conventional, conventionally grown cotton is because of the intensive use of chemicals. Uh, organophosphates in uh, fertilizing cotton fields. Uh, these were developed basically as nerve gases for World War I. Um, the intensive use of insecticides uh, to uh, control pests. Uh, something like 25% of the world's uh, uh, agricultural chemicals were used in the cultivation of cotton. We really found this out by accident when we had to close down one of our stores when it turned out that we had uh, formaldehyde off-gassing from cotton clothes stored in the basement. We did an investigation. We learned just how harmful these chemicals were. And we decided, uh, this was in the early 90s, that we were going to change our practices. We did not want to be in business. We did not want to be in the sportswear business if we had to produce clothes made with these processes. So. We did our homework. We bought most of the organic cotton being grown in California, but we didn't do enough homework. And so what happened, what we discovered, 
is that when we bought the cotton from farmers, we broke our connection to the global supply chain. And that global supply chain had been built up with a, uh, a lot of work and momentum over 20 or 30 years. So the farmers had no relationship to spinners who actually turn the, the fiber into yarn, no relationship to the weavers and knitters who turn that into fabric. And what we discovered was we had put enormous pressure on our designers and our production people who had to do everything that they had had to do every season beforehand in terms of designing and specking the clothes and in terms of choosing the colors and presenting to the major accounts. And yet we were requiring them to uh, find an entire new infrastructure to, su to, to supply cotton sportswear. And everybody said, you know, this is crazy. Why are we doing, why are we the martyrs? We're gonna have to raise our prices. Nobody's asked for this, no customers asked for this. So what we did is we took, custom, we took our employees 40 at a time to the San Joaquin Valley and took them to the conventional fields and then to the organic fields. And the, the critical lesson, I mean, when the employees, when it became tangible, when the employees were in the bus with the windows open, smelling the conventional cotton fields that smelled like a, like a, a, an indoor laboratory with bad ventilation, or when they stuck their hand in the soil and found no life at all, no worms that take three years to come back after you stop spraying, uh, no vegetation at all. People would come back from that and they'd say, you know, this is a pain, but the company's doing the right thing and we're going to help make it happen. That was, that was a critical event for us because it led to almost everything we've done since. I think when, when people work together in a, in a work community, they, you, you experience some of the same uh, feelings uh, that, that people have in their ordinary lives. If you're an athlete, if you're a runner, you wanna best you beat your time. If you're a climber, you wanna climb a route that's more difficult. A surfer wants to surf a, a more difficult wave. And I think our people started to understand the challenges they faced, but then what, when they met them successfully, then they wanted to meet a more difficult challenge afterwards. Um, and this is just, this is all through business. You're gonna find instances like this where people discover that the way they do business is really problematic. It takes a lot of work to change it. But if you step back a bit and you understand your business's purpose that, and that purpose, you understand the company's values, you are able to make a difference. Wonderful. And I think this, this uh, is sort of a, a wonderful example also of how this is a communal and collective effort, yes. right? Yeah. And, and how this is critical and that is oftentimes not understood. It's not necessary only here and understanding this, yeah. but it's feeling, experiencing, and then just saying, no, this, it's yeah. a shift, right? right? Yes. And you can, you know, you can manage top down using fear, but you can't manage bottom up using fear. And w when you manage bottom up, what you're doing is you're taking advantage of people's personal values, what, what they, people want to do the right thing. And if they feel that they're allowed to do that at work, they will. I've been involved in countless initiatives at Patagonia where I had no budget. I had no staff. And we were able to pull something off because everybody was really committed to the outcome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Vincent. And students, I want you to just pay attention to these words and these insights because they might come across as potentially trivial. And I think there is very deep insight here of how, how we as human beings operate, how we are in this world and how we do want to do the right thing if we have understood what that could be and if we are given permission in a sense. It can help us organize ourselves in a different way. It can enliven us. It seems I think that's what I'm hearing from the yeah. way that, that Patagonia was sort of seeing this as a challenge, like almost like a sport. <laughs> not as the wave necessarily, that was something that, that came earlier and it still probably plays a big role in the culture, right? But that sort of this sportive competitiveness of doing better and, and understanding what better is, connecting it with your personal mm -hmm. values and as a shared value kind of exercise. Yeah, thank you. That's, 
that's a very that's a very strong explanation i think of what what went on okay wonderful so um students just think about that also go to this example of patagonia and i think vincent you would also say that yes you're sort of on a journey you mm -hmm. haven't achieved a particular goal yet here in terms of being regenerative and, and sustainable mm -hmm. right right but it's a journey worthwhile being on. And that's, I think, what the Business Roundtable stands for. It's what you students can be part of, this journey. This is not a, a, a one-time kind of engagement. This is something that you can learn as the global challenges basically unfold themselves. And the more you are able to understand those large challenges, then you can bring them to the ground and also feel how you can align your personal values, your skills, your efforts with what an organization of your choice uh, can and needs to do. So thank you, Vincent, again. And uh, we, we're, we're gonna stop here for now. Okay.